today's Inside the Sixers as the Sixers take on the Pacers tonight in Indiana with a chance, Michael, to clinch the number one seed. They might be a little shorthanded tonight, though. It looks like uh, an interesting possibility here for the Sixers in Indiana. So what do we know about tonight's roster? Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty much up in the air, Mike. Like you said, there's a, a lot of guys. I think Embiid's questionable. Um, some of the other starters, and I think it makes sense. Obviously, the Sixers are trying to balance, you know, securing that one seed for the postseason while also trying to get, um, you know, some of their key contributors some rest. They're one win away from securing that seed at this point. Like you just said, uh, you know, they got to win one more. So I think over the next few games, they're going to try to obviously do enough to pull out a win while also making sure that, you know, Joel, Ben, uh, Tobias, some of these other guys get, you know, a little bit of rest before the, the playoff run begins. Yeah, that's a tough scenario because Doc said it yesterday, Mike, that even if they play to the last day, they're still going to have a whole week off before they actually not only play a playoff game, but I guess it's not going to be until that Friday night that they will know who they will actually play in the playoffs, right? Yeah, it's it's a you know a unique thing this year, Mike, because of the, like you said with that play-in tournament, it leaves um, you know all the teams that are in firm standing at the top of the conference are kind of. You know, like all of us, they're going to have to be watching the games and seeing how things shake out to get an idea of, you know, who they're going to play, which is a little bit of a disadvantage for for a top seeded team like that, because traditionally you would, um, you know, have a little bit more of an opportunity to prepare for, you know, a specific team and a specific matchup. And this year, um, you know, it's going to be kind of a more more of a wait and see approach. So they win tonight. They win the one seed based on the fact that Milwaukee lost last night. Right. And then. um they would have three games left. Brooklyn would only have three games left. If the Sixers lost all three and Brooklyn won all three, they would be tied. Philly wins the tiebreaker. So that's why uh, they win tonight and they're in as the one seed here. And what we have chronicled a lot, Michael, being that one seed is, I, I mean, that's the difference in believing they can make it to the finals and not for me, right? I mean, is that where you stand? Yeah, it's huge, Mike. I think I don't think it can be overstated how how important that is when you look at the standings and when you've you know if you've really watched the Eastern Conference this season, there's three teams obviously that have really separated themselves from the pack, uh, being obviously the Sixers, the Bucks, and the Nets. And you know, having to only play one of those teams and having that potential matchup come in the conference finals after those two teams have already battled each other, you know, in a potential series the round before that, I don't think you can overstate how important that is for the Sixers to, you know, avoid one of those teams and then only have to end up playing one for the chance to move on to the NBA finals. Yeah. I know that, um, you know, the fact of the matter is if, and they could have a very interesting uh, path there. And Michael Caskey Blomain covers the NBA for CBS sports, kind of looking at like four, five, six, it's not going to be determined really till Sunday, but what do you think? I, I hate to bypass the first round because we have no idea who they're going to play in the first round. It could be Boston. It could be Charlotte. It could be Indiana. It could be Miami. I guess a very outside chance of that. And it could be Washington. Playing one of those four teams in the playoff in round and then having to play New York or Atlanta is a much easier path than the two teams in the two and the three spot. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. It's it's not even close. Like you said, you don't know who it's going to be at this point. But if, if you're the Sixers, I mean, you have to obviously respect it and can't overlook any team. But any of those teams in that in that handful that you mentioned, whether it's the Heat, Celtics, Hornets, Pacers, Wizards, uh, you know, you would have to go into a series against one of those teams feeling, you know, infinitely better uh, about your chances. The Celtics obviously just lost Jalen Brown. Hornets are still dealing with the Gordon Hayward injury. Um, you know, a lot of these teams are banged up. And for the Sixers, um, for once, it seems like health is actually on their side. It's funny because we've been talking for yeah. years. Uh, you know, they've been the team that's had players missing going into the postseason or that they've been worried about. And for once, it seems like, you know, all their key contributors are healthy and ready. And some of these other teams are dealing with injury issues, which will, you know, only should only benefit the Sixers in, in the postseason. So in that second round, I mean, first round. OK, let's talk about the first round. Which of those worry you the most Washington Indiana Boston Charlotte I would probably say Washington out of that group Mike Boston probably would have been the answer before Jalen Brown went down um, but without him they there's just a team to me I mean they've been a team that's been up and down all season and without his production on both ends they just don't have enough you know firepower or enough defense to really um, you know I think bother the Sixers to me I, I think a lot of it is about which teams are playing better at this point in the season and to me that's the Wizards um, 
I know they came short last night, but they've been, you know, playing some of the best ball in the league since April. They have, you know, Bradley Beal, uh, Westbrook are both fully healthy. Well, Beal's resting, but he will be healthy for the, the playoffs. Um, you know, they're playing excellent basketball. They're decently a deep team. And, you know, they're one of those teams that, uh, you know, obviously if, if you catch them and they're, they're playing at, at, you know, at the top of their powers in a hot streak, they could give, you know, any team some trouble. So for me, out of any of those teams, I think the Wizards would be the, the biggest concern. Yeah, and then, okay, so you play Miami Thursday night. You have a shot to kind of keep them down. Miami, Atlanta, or the Knicks, which of that group is the, is the worst matchup? Probably, in my eyes, it would probably be the Heat, just based off the the experience. The Knicks are are a dangerous team too. They're legit uh, on both ends of the ball, especially defensively. I think what they've been able to do during the second half of the season has been extremely impressive. But to me, it's still the Heat. The Heat have kind of been a team that's, you know, unlike the Celt- like the Celtics, they've had an up and down season, but a lot of it's been to you know injury issues, things like that, and they still have, you know, when they're fully healthy and as a cohesive unit, they can be extremely dangerous. Um, You know, we saw them go obviously all the way to the finals last year, largely the same roster. You still have, you know, the shooters, you still have Jimmy Butler and and Andre Iguodala, Bam Adebayo. So, so to me, the heat are uh, probably the most dangerous team in that middle range that the Sixers could potentially play in a series. Right. You know, it's funny because the Knicks are a team that like defensively in the playoffs, that's a grind but they don't have that guy or do they that can score that big bucket that you feel like you need in a playoff series. Yeah, that's, that's the thing with, with the Knicks, obviously Julius Randle has really stepped into that role this season. He's developed into an all-star He's developed into their go-to guy, but you know, we've yet to see how him and the Knicks react in a playoff situation where obviously the, the opponent is going to scheme uh, to get the ball out of Randall's hands and force some of the other guys on the team to make, you know, to make plays at that time, at that point, you're looking at, you know, RJ Barrett, Derek Rose, who are obviously, you know, talented players, but they don't have necessarily the, you know, cachet that you would feel really good about them being the go-to guys for the team in the, in the postseason. So to me, the Knicks are a team that are going to have to get it done defensively and then hope that some other guys can step up, uh, you know, around Julius Randle. I think they could make some noise, but if you're talking about a matchup specifically against the Sixers, I don't think they have enough firepower offensively to, you know, make it a series. All right, MKB, Boston, seven, eight, or out? <sighs> That's tough. I think they'll end up, I do think they'll end up in uh, probably maybe the eighth seed. Uh, they do still have obviously Tatum, Kemba Walker, uh, some other guys. It's, it's just tough for me to imagine. I mean, that's a team that I thought would have been probably top four in the East heading into the season. Didn't shake out that way, but I'm not ready to totally write them out of the playoff picture yet. What has, what, I mean, are, are massive changes coming there? What has been the problem? You have to think so, Mike. This has probably been one of the most disappointing seasons in recent Celtics memory after, you know, a run where they went to the conference finals last year. And I think they were just banking on, you know, some of their guys taking major steps forward, mainly in Tatum and Brown. And, you know, they both improved, but I don't think they, you know, took the steps forward quite that the team was expecting. They didn't really bring in, uh, you know, enough talent around those guys. Kemba Walker is solid. Tristan Thompson is solid. And then you look at their bench, there's a lot of, you know, one multi like guys that don't do a lot of different things. And it just seems like they don't have the same defensive intensity or firepower that they've had in, in previous seasons. All right. In the play in game, Western conference Lakers warriors, is that the highest rated playoff game above <laughs> any other playoff game? Yeah. You got to think that the NBA is probably uh, pretty happy about the way that shaked out. And I know LeBron said that he thought that the guy that came up with the playing tournament should be fired, but the NBA is looking at that matchup and they're probably thinking about giving that guy a raise because <laughs> that sort of game is going to draw, you know, huge interest to when you're talking about two of argu- arguably the two biggest stars in the game and LeBron and Steph Curry going at it, you know, for a chance to just get into the playoffs. So I think that game is pretty much the exact reason why the, the league wanted this play in tournament. And I think that's a, you know, obviously it will be must watch for basketball fans. Yeah, that's right, how it shakes out right now. The Lakers are seven and pretty firmly in seven. I mean, it's a game and a half between them and six. Although Portland's got a brutal stretch of games here. Their last three games are Utah, Phoenix and Denver. Uh, <laughs> but the that's Lakers tough. have four games, all very winnable. Uh, but we know that nothing's set in stone for them. The Warriors are only a half game up on the eight spot, so they could fall to nine. But I'm sure the NBA is saying, man, let's get the late. Although, 
The winner of that game would be the seven seed, and then the, the loser would play either Memphis or San Antonio. So both of those teams still have a shot to get in the playoffs. I would imagine the NBA wants the Lakers and the Warriors in at seven and eight. And then you would have the Lakers playing Phoenix likely in round one and Golden State playing Utah in round one. You could see potentially two upsets on that side of the bracket. Absolutely. And imagine being the Jazz and the Suns, two of the best stories of the season, working, you know, hard all season and, and to secure those top seeds and then having to, like you said, having to go up against LeBron or Steph Curry in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, you know, that's that's wow. a tough, tough uh, thing for it to shake out that way. Yeah. And then the only other scenario, the likely scenario is that the L.A. gets out of that play in um, round. They would move up to six and likely would have to play the Clippers, the Clippers. in round number one. So. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan of the play-in tournament. I think it's a little gimmicky, but it has certainly added a lot, especially because of the fact that you have a team like the Lakers that is in play there, and then you have Curry that's in play there. It has definitely added a layer of conversation and intrigue that has not you know, been around. So is the play-in tournament here to stay? That's a great question, Mike, and I think that's obviously going to be one of the big things to keep an eye on moving forward. This LeBron has a pretty big voice. He, he does. And so does, you know, a guy like Mark Cuban, who's, uh, you know, expressed his distaste for it also. But at the same time, like you said, I think from a fan perspective, it's certainly made these last few weeks of the regular season more interesting. Uh, you know, I'm sure the NBA will look at viewership numbers compared to previous seasons. And I think there's a chance that it, it sticks around. And Michael, we're talking about the play in tournament and those matchups and all the possibilities and not the teams that are quote unquote tanking because it doesn't seem I mean, there's there only go. one team that has less than 20 wins this year. And I think that's a that's a huge part of it. And I think that was definitely some of the motivation for them to do this because it gives the incentive for these teams to, you know, normally by after the All-Star break, it's pretty clear which teams are, you know, completely out of the picture. And at that point, the, the you know, the tank starts. And this year, like you said, there's only one team with a, a record below 20 wins in, in the Houston Rockets. Uh, and you have teams that have been in the conversation at this point. Obviously, some have started to fade away. But for the last few weeks, a lot of these teams were, you know, right in the picture up until the last couple of weeks. And I think that's uh, definitely a thing for the NBA where it takes some of the focus off the teams that have been, you know, tanking and looking at some of these teams that are, you know, still competitive. For He's sure. Michael Kasky Blomain from CBS Sports. He's their NBA writer at The Real Mike KB. By this time next week, we will know the Sixers' opponent, and their seeding, and we will be getting you ready for the NBA playoffs first round. MKB, you're a gentleman and a scholar. Same to you, Mike. Good talking to you. See you, my man. He's, uh, of course, uh, CBS Sports here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline, and he'll be back with us on Tuesday next week.